Welcome back for another Sabbath school lesson as we study the book of Psalms. We're in lesson number three this week, The Lord Reigns. As I read this lesson over, I tried to summarize it with the aspects of God and his character. And there are really five different aspects of God that we're studying this week. First, Christ as the all-powerful creator. Secondly, Christ as the supreme Lord. Thirdly, Christ as the righteous judge. Fourth, Christ as the redeeming savior. And fifth, Christ as the supreme lawgiver. Let's dive right into our lesson. If you look at the introduction to the lesson, it talks about the Psalms unswervingly upholding the foundational belief in God's sovereign reign. The Lord created and sustains everything that he's created. So this lesson focuses on the sovereignty of God. What do we mean by sovereignty of God? By the sovereignty of God, we mean that God reigns over all things. God sustains all things. And that even when God allows through his permissive will for evil to arise, God is still on the throne. Evil will one day run its course. And in God's time, evil will be judged, condemned, and eradicated. So this lesson focuses on the fact of the reign of God, the fact that he is sovereign in all the world. If we look at Sunday's lesson, we focus on Christ as the all-powerful creator. We find that in two Psalms that are listed, Psalm 8, that says, verse 3, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you made him or created him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. So here, God is positioned as the one that created us, the one that fashioned us. This is brought out even more clearly in Psalm 100, where David speaks and he says in verse 3, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. Uh, that's a little um, interesting twist on self-reliance that uh, God made us. We didn't create ourselves. We didn't make ourselves. We are totally dependent on our creator. Now, in an age when the evolutionary hypothesis has become so popular and commonplace, the Psalms speak to us of the fact that we're not a speck of cosmic dust, we're not simply skin covering bones, we're not some genetic accident, but that we were fashioned and created by God. That makes all the difference because if God created us, we have value, we have worth in his sight. If God created us, he cares for us. And wherever we find ourselves in life, the one that made us, fashioned us and created us is there for us. Our lesson under Sunday goes on, pointing out that the Lord has created everything. He has no beginning, no end. He's everlasting and superior over the gods of the nations, which only are the work of man's hands, nothing more. The idols have hands, but they handle not. As for the Lord, in his hand are the deep places of the earth, and his hands form the dry land. So the psalmist is pointing out that God is the all-powerful creator. Uh, you know, when you look at Psalm 19, for example, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night uttereth knowledge. In other words, when I look at the stars and see the amazing precision of creation, it indicates a creator God the story is told of Napoleon on a ship with his sailors, and they were debating the existence of God. 
They were giving all the philosophical reasons why they believed God did or did not exist. And it seemed that the atheistic forces were winning. And uh, Napoleon came up to this group, as the story is told, and just stood there gazing at the stars. And then he said, look up, gentlemen, who made the stars? And, you know, the stars, when you think about it, and the planets, the planets all rotating, revolving around the sun as the center of our solar system. Who keeps those planets in their orbit? Who keeps the magnetic pull in the field from pulling Earth too close to the sun so it consumes? Who keeps Earth at the very right place so it doesn't go further and freeze? The psalmists know the answer to that question. Creation testifies to God's love. Everything exists, owes its existence to God who sustains life. I think one of the main things in our lesson this week to point out is that life is not a cosmic accident. Everything, everything in life is sustained by God. So we move from the all-powerful creator to the sovereign Lord. Monday's lesson, the Lord reigns. Now, what does it mean to be sovereign? It means he's supreme. It means that he's in control. The first sentence says, closely tied, in fact, inseparably tied to the Lord as creator, is the Lord as sovereign ruler. Now, what is it that characterizes God's reign? We find this in Psalm 97. Psalm 97 and uh, verse 1 and verse 2. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. Verse 2, clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So the characteristic of God's reign, righteousness and judgment. What is righteousness? Righteousness has to do with right living. Righteousness has to do with living in harmony with God's will. Justice has to do with a characteristic of God of fairness, honesty, integrity. And so we look here, it says under the note for Monday's lesson, the Lord's rule is demonstrated in his works of creation, salvation and judgment. The Lord establishes his kingship over the whole world. God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, unparalleled in power and majesty. The Lord's reign is established on mercy, justice, and righteousness, and it brings order and stability to the created world. I want you to think about that. Because God is on the throne, because God reigns, our world can have order and stability. Righteousness is the foundation of his throne. That is, through his power, human beings can live righteously. Justice is the foundation of his throne. He always deals equitably. And even in life's unfairness, even in life's injustice, one day there will be a judgment and God will set everything right. So the fact that we know that the Lord is on his throne, that the Lord reigns, brings stability to the universe. Now, it is true that we live in a world of good and evil. It is true that wickedness at times prevails, but we can be assured that God is judge. And as a righteous judge, he will make all things right. That's the theme of Psalm 75. Now, remember, there are five aspects of God we're looking at. God, the all-powerful creator. God, the supreme Lord. God, the righteous judge. So we'll look at Psalm 75. And in Psalm 75, it talks about the fact of the judgment of, of, of God and the fact that he is a righteous judge. Uh, let's look at Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7. For exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is judge. 
he puts down one and exalts another. In other words, even in our own personal lives, we can trust God to bring us to the place that he desires us to be in, the position he desires us to be in. We can trust him. He is, according to this, the righteous judge. Then, for in the hand of the Lord, there's a cup, and the wine is red. It's fully mixed, and, it's, and he pours it out. In the Bible, wine is often a symbol of false doctrine. It's also a symbol of God's judgment, his, his, his wrath. When we read about the wrath of God in the Bible, we're reading about his judgment. There is a very good explanation of this in the text itself and in the lesson itself. It says, in Psalm 75, several images, I'm reading Tuesday's lesson, second paragraph. In Psalm 75, several images depict the irrevocable destruction of the wicked. The image of a cup with red wine conveys the intensity of God's fury. In other words, God's judgment, God's wrath. But then notice what it says here. It says, but I will declare forever, I'll sing the praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. What do horns represent in the Bible? Horns represent power. They represent strength. So if the horns of the wicked are cut off, their strength is gone. So Psalm 75 points out that although the wicked will reign at times, although the wicked will seem to triumph over the righteous, that God's fury, God's righteousness, uh, God's judgment will prevail. The wicked will be demolished. They will be destroyed. Their, their horns will be cut off. That is, their strength will be gone. So three things so far. Have you gotten them? First, God is the creator. Secondly, God is the sovereign Lord. Thirdly, God is the righteous judge. And um, in the last part of Tuesday's lesson, last paragraph, it says, the Psalms convey the same notion that's expressed in other biblical texts, that God's judgment begins with God's people and is extended to the whole earth. The psalmist cries out to God to judge him, but relies on God's righteousness to defend him. So God judges us, but God is righteous to defend us. So when you think of the judgment, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about God's fairness, God's goodness, but we're also thinking about God's mercy. We're thinking about God's grace. When I think about the judgment in Psalms, I'm reminded of this thought. If God can do anything possible to save us, he will do that. In Wednesday's lesson, we read about a God in the light of the judgment, who's ever mindful of his covenant, his covenant, his promise that Christ would come, his promise that grace and mercy would flow from the cross, his promise that through his power and by his grace, we could one day rejoice with him in the promised land. The question raised in Wednesday's lesson is a powerful question. The theme of judgment prompts a significant question. How can God's people have peace with God and the assurance of salvation at the time of judgment? So it gives us three texts, and I think it's worth it to look at all of them. Psalm 94 and verse 14. Psalm 94, verse 14. The question is, how can we have peace in the light of the judgment? For the Lord will not cast off his people, he will, nor will he forsake his inheritance, but judgment will return to righteousness and all the upright in heart will follow it. So God does not forsake his people in the judgment. It is God that's for us in the judgment, not God that's against us. The second text in our lesson is Psalm 107, verse 7 to 10. Psalm 107, if you have your Bibles, if you're following along with a little notebook, Psalm 107, verse 7 to 10. And again, we're asking the question, how can we have assurance in the judgment? And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for habitation. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness 
and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons because they rebelled against the words of God, they despised the counsel. They cried to God in their trouble, verse 13. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness. He broke the chains in pieces. Wow, this is our God. This is our God. You may have drifted away from him. There may be something in your life that says, I'll never pass the judgment. There may be something going on in your life right now that's not in harmony with his will. But according to the Psalms, you can have the absolute assurance that God will save you out of every distress, that God will break the chains in pieces that have bound you, that in the judgment, God is not against you, but God is for you. That is really made clear in the judgment chapter in Daniel 7. If we come over to Daniel 7 and we look at Daniel 7, verse 22, we find that uh, this idea of judgment and God's in favor of us in judgment is very plain. Daniel 7, verse 22. Until the, I was watching, I'm going to look at verse 21 as well. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made, now catch this, in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Wait, judgment was made what? In favor of the saints of the Most High. If you come over, for example, to verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms unto the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So the judgment is not so much to find out everything that's wrong about us so God can condemn us. The judgment reveals the goodness of God before a waiting world and a watching universe. The judgment reveals that God is merciful, that God has done everything he could to save every human being. When your name comes up in judgment, when my main name comes up in judgment, God will ask the question before the whole universe, could I have done anything more to save Mark Finley? I sent the Holy Spirit to his heart. I convicted him of sin. I revealed myself to him in circumstances of life. I led him to the word of God. I revealed Christ to him. Could I have done anything more? Everybody that's lost is lost not because they didn't have a chance, not because they didn't have an opportunity, but they're lost because their attitude of rebellion against everything that God has done. God reaches out to each of us. And to be lost means we keep saying, no God, no God, no God, no God. Judgment is in favor of the saints, where God reveals before the whole universe that he's done everything possible to save every human being. Uh, and here, that's what the psalmist shares with us under Wednesday's lesson. God's judgments are given to turn people to righteousness and to demonstrate that God cares for them. So we have the little judgments that come in our lives now and we see God working and that's to turn us to God so that in the final judgment, God can reveal he's done everything possible to save us. Judgment though implies law because if you don't have any law, you have no basis for judgment. Our works do not save us. We're saved by grace. Ephesians 2 verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's the gift of God. So it is our, we are saved by grace. But if you look at Ephesians 2 verse 8 and go on to verse 9 and 10, but we are his workmanship. So grace is so good it works. The grace of God forgives us. The grace of God pardons us. The grace of God reaches out in our lives with mercy. But that grace is a dynamic, powerful grace that leads us to live obedient lives. And so that's why Psalm 19, verse 7, Psalm 19, verse 7. In fact, Psalm 19 is one of my favorite psalms. It is a, it's an amazing psalm. 
of God's goodness, God's grace. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Notice in Psalm 19:7 it says, the testimony of the Lord is sure. If you look, for example, at Psalm 119, verse 165, you have a very similar idea. Psalm 119, verse 165, great peace have those who love your law. Nothing causes them to stumble. Now in Psalm 19, we read about the testimony of God is sure, it's certain. And here we read about great peace have they that love thy law. Nothing causes them to stumble. Now we need to add one more text to that to get the complete picture. Psalm chapter 18, verse 30. Psalm 18, verse 30. And this will round out the picture. Psalm 18, we're looking there at verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust him. So let's put these things together. First, the testimony of the Lord is true. Second, those who trust God's law are filled with peace. Thirdly, God's word is sure or certain. Now, when the Bible uses this expression in Psalm 19, verse 7, the testimony of the Lord is sure, what is the Bible talking about with this idea of the testimony? God's testimony has to do with his instructions, his guidelines, his law. And it says that that is, is certain. So the law of God, the instruction of God, according to the psalmist, is the certain way for our lives to be filled with joy and happiness. So let's put this lesson together. First, God is our creator. He fashioned us. He is our sovereign Lord. He's in control of the universe. He's our judge, so we have accountability to him. But this judge is merciful. He's righteous. In the judgment, he has done everything he could to save us. And he's given us his testimony, his law, as instructions in how to live. And as we follow his law and live in harmony with his will, our lives will be filled with joy and happiness. There may be ups, there may be downs, there may be mountain peaks, there may be dark valleys, but our creator, our sovereign Lord, our judge who will judge all evil, the one that is working to save us, this very God will be with us in every area of our lives, working to bring us to salvation. God wants to save you, my friend, more than you want to be saved. And God is doing everything he can in his love and grace and mercy to save us in his kingdom. That's something to praise God about. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you with all of our hearts that you are our creator, you're our Lord, you're our savior, our redeemer, you're our judge, and indeed you're our coming king. We praise you for that. We thank you that the Psalms speak of this almighty God who rules the universe and rules our hearts. Teach us to be faithful to you each moment. In Christ's name, amen.